Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's lecture. It is the third in this series, entitled The Paradox of Singapore and the Dialectic of Governance, by Mr. Peter Ho, our 2016-2017 SR Nathan Fellow. Following his lecture, Mr. Ho will take questions from the floor. The Q&A session will be chaired by Mr. Cheng Kai Fung, Principal Private Secretary to the Prime Minister. This lecture will be filmed and uploaded on the IPS website and YouTube. May I now invite Mr. Ho to take the floor, please. Uh, good evening to all of you. Few countries today would be classified as sovereign and independent city-states, and rightly so because their continuing existence is a special challenge. Cities like Hong Kong are sometimes referred to as city-states because of their high degree of autonomy, but they are neither sovereign nor independent. The consensus is that only Singapore, together with Monaco and Vatican City, are true independent city-states. And even then, only Singapore has all the attributes of a sovereign state, in particular because it is fully responsible for its own defence. In contrast, Monaco depends on France for its defence and Vatican City on Italy. Looking back in history, there are the famous city-states of antiquity, like Athens, Sparta and Carthage. In medieval times, the standout is Venice, for centuries, the city of Venice was a flourishing center of trade between Europe and Asia, especially in silk, grain, and the spices. By the 13th century, Venice had become the second largest city in Europe after Paris and its most prosperous. But as former Foreign Minister Giorgio observed, Venice never felt invulnerable she never took her success for granted. It was this sense of insecurity which spurred her on, which kept her guards up, her citizens united, and her institutions vital. Perhaps the central and most obvious paradox of Singapore is that its national boundaries perfectly coincide with its city limits. And what is more, the fantasy and glamour of Singapore's Global city status often stand in sharp contrast to the insecurities that define its statehood. Sovereign city states are anomalies, surviving despite their very small size, without natural resource, and surrounded by much larger neighbors. Their existence is a constant struggle with challenges that larger nations with hinterlands and resources do not worry about. They are a paradox, the exception that proves the rule that size matters. Singapore's sudden elevation to the status of sovereign city-state was an accident of history, an unintended consequence of the politics of the time. Singapore was never conceived of as an independent nation. Our raison d'etre had been as a service centre for regional trade and a trading outpost of the British Empire. In 1957, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew observed that island nations are political jokes. And in 1962, the Singapore government described the merger of Singapore into the Federation of Malaysia as an inevitable historical development. Indeed, if things had gone the way Mr. Lee and his colleagues had intended, Singapore would still be part of Malaysia. In an oral history interview in 1982, Mr. S. Rajaratnam spoke about the Singaporean leaders' conflicted feelings on separation. He said, emotionally, we were still rejecting it, but intellectually, we had no choice. We ourselves believed that an independent Singapore was not viable. That was not just a device to have a merger but I think it was a basic, genuine belief. So now we had to prove that what we believed in is not necessarily so. And soon Singapore could make concrete claims to success, 
GDP jumped from 974 million US dollars in 1965 to 36.2 billion dollars in 1990. After 50 years, GDP stood at 292.7 billion dollars US. Life expectancy has increased by about 10 years every generation, from 64.5 years in 1965 to 75.3 years in 1990, and now 82.7 years. That Singapore moved from third world to first within two generations, less than 50 years, is without precedent and nothing short of a modern miracle. And Singapore's success has evoked much admiration one of the early admirers was the late Deng Xiaoping, who visited Singapore as senior vice premier in 1978. He was greatly interested in Singapore's social and economic development experience. Deng saw how Singapore, without natural resource, had been able to provide a good life for its people through good governance and to create jobs through pragmatic policies aimed at bringing in foreign investment. And this inspired him to embrace the market economy. But Singapore also has had its share of detractors. In an interview with the Asian Wall Street Journal in August 1998, then Indonesian President B.J. Habibie dismissed Singapore as just a little red dot, with only 3 million people then compared to Indonesia's sea of green population of over 200 million. Instead of being intimidated, Singapore has embraced this disparaging put-down as a badge of honour. A few months after Mr Habibie's remarks, then Deputy Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong was quoted in the Jakarta Post as saying, A little red dot is not an issue. It's a ge geographical fact we are small, without resources, while the population is small, but we have to make a living. And Singaporeans do so as The Economist described it in a 2015 report, with a characteristic mix of pride and paranoia. Indeed, the criticism of paranoia has been levelled at Singapore many times. In particular, many observers refer to our attitude towards defence and foreign policy as part of a siege mentality, or kiasuism, if you will. But arguably, if Singapore was not kiasu, we would likely not have survived to celebrate 50 years of independence in 2015. At independence, there were huge challenges to overcome. Our small size, a heterogeneous and migrant population without any sense of nationhood, lack of natural resources, and a geopolitical vulnerability stemming from the double minority situation as a Chinese majority state in a predominantly Malay world. But struggle is a Darwinian process in which only the strong and strong-minded survive. It was our water scarcity that led us to develop water treatment technologies that we now export to other parts of the world, including the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. Our shortage of land, poor urban conditions, and severe lack of safe and quality housing led us to develop urban planning solutions and both high-rise as well as underground space. Our lack of strategic depth impelled us to acquire or develop sophisticated bespoke defense systems and innovative training models and arrangements with friendly countries to overcome this challenge. But this does not mean that our fundamental problems have been solved. Our small size and low-lying position make us extremely vulnerable to climate change. Our high global rankings, such as being the world's busiest port by shipping tonnage, are constantly tested by geopolitical and geoeconomic developments. Even though we have developed new technologies in our water security, as former PUB chairman Tanji Po once put it, our great challenges in water management are climate change and complacency among our populace. Singapore's palace geostrategic position has been the driving force for the country to find ways to overcome these challenges. As a result, today we have the heft to make our way in the world 
and to wield some influence. But obviously, we cannot assume that we have overcome our vulnerabilities. In that sense, Singapore, more than most, is a perpetual work in progress. With SG50 came a slew of articles examining Singapore's exceptionalism. The Economist summed up our challenges ahead. Its leaders hold themselves to high standards, but it is debatable whether the system Mr. Lee can built can survive in its present form. All the unfavorable conditions that attended Singapore's unexpected elevation to sovereign city state still exist today. But our success in overcoming them may well have masked the deep challenges that remain and remain mostly undiminished. This is the paradox of Singapore. In 2010, my friend, the futurist Peter Schwartz, described Singapore as the apple of nations. He was not using apple in its idiomatic form, but favorably comparing Singapore as a nation to Apple the company, which was then, as now, an inspiring paragon of innovation. Apple is famous for its innovative and revolutionary products, and many think that this year, Apple will become the first trillion dollar company in terms of market cap. It was high praise from Schwartz, but of course, it begs the question of whether we can truly be the apple of nations or whether we are in reality just a little red dot. Schwartz, who is no rosy-eyed admirer of Singapore, also warned, the difference between Apple and Singapore is that the people of Singapore don't know how good they have it. They don't know just what a remarkable entity has been created here. They don't share yet that sense of passion that the people at Apple do. And this concern was echoed in Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong's 2016 National Day Rally speech when he said, what I would like to have is that we are blessed with a divine discontent, always not quite satisfied with what we have, always driven to do better. At the same time, we have the wisdom to count our blessings so that we know how precious Singapore is and we know how to enjoy it and to protect it. Now, I endeavored to establish in my first two lectures that our operating environment is a fast changing and complex one. It is to lead to the fundamental question of how Singapore can survive and succeed as a sovereign and independent city state. There are clearly no easy answers. It is very easy to criticize from the side, but it is not easy to find the right answers. Each big decision and every major policy is not an exercise in finding the absolute right answer. It is always an exercise in making the right judgment, a balanced one that serves the larger interests of the majority and of the country. And even that judgment must change because the operating environment is changing not at the pace of velocity, but at the rate of acceleration. Now, I shall use the dialectical method to try to extract some insights, if not answers, to this question. The dialectic is a discourse between two or more people holding different points of view about a subject. Here, there's only one person. Eh? But both sides, however, share the same goal of establishing truth through well-reasoned arguments. It is through such discourse that perhaps some answers will emerge about what it takes for Singapore to survive and succeed over the long term. Thrust into an unwelcome and unwanted independence, the Singapore government was in a hurry to turn the precarious situation around and to transform Singapore in a into a modern metropolis in the matchless pledge of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew in 1965. So it is not surprising that in the beginning, governance in Singapore was characterized by big government, if you will, through strong regulation, seeking compliance with policy rules, and maintaining as efficient a system as possible in order to get things moving and to get things done. Now through this approach, 
the government embarked on a number of major initiatives that helped to lay the foundations of Singapore's prosperity and stability. These included a massive public housing program, heavy investments in infrastructure, in public transport, our port and airport, and an activist government-led approach to attract foreign investments and build up the capabilities to support higher value-added activities. In these and many other policy domains, the visible hand of government was as critical as the invisible hand of markets. The government's interventions enabled new markets and industries to develop. They also helped to ensure that the economic growth through the 70s and 80s benefited all segments of the population. Now, some see this as the Singapore government exercising substantial influence, not just over traditional areas of policy like defense, macroeconomics, and infrastructure, but also in areas like tree planting and compulsory savings, which are seen as more municipal or personal in other countries. The ban on the sale of chewing gum has been cited by many as an example of a pervasive and intrusive government role. Uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew made no bones about his belief that the government should intervene on a spectrum of issues. He famously said, I'm often accused of interfering in the private lives of citizens. Yes, if I did not, had I not done that, we wouldn't be here today. And I say without the slightest remorse that we wouldn't be here. We would not have made economic progress if we had not intervened on very personal matters who your neighbour is, how you live, the noise you make, how you spit, or what language you use. We decide what is right, never mind what the people think. But on many significant measures, Singapore's government is not at all big. The Washington think tank, the Heritage Foundation, together with the Wall Street Journal, compiles an annual index of economic freedom, measuring several dimensions of a, company's econo of a country's economic freedom. One of these dimensions is the size of government spending, which in Singapore has been very low for a country of our level of development. According to the most recent index of economic freedom, this is the 2017 one, total government expenditure in Singapore constituted 18.2% of GDP, and this is among the lowest in the world. In comparison, Hong Kong's total government expenditure amounted to 18.3% of a GDP, but it does not have to spend on defence. New Zealand, which was ranked third behind Hong Kong and Singapore for economic freedom, government expenditure totaled 42.2% of GDP. The system of government in Singapore was inherited from the British actually from the British East India Company, the preeminent global MNC of the day that Sir Stamford Raffles worked for. So it is not as if we started from scratch. And because of these antecedents, it is natural that Singapore looks to developments in administrations that are based on the Westminster system of government. It is not surprising that the practice of governance in Singapore has broadly tracked the trajectories of other governments in countries like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, and especially in the United Kingdom, the birthplace of the Westminster system. Nevertheless, it has always been to adapt and not to adopt blindly. Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1979. She was a strong believer in small government as opposed to big government, and in the ability of the private sector to provide goods and services more efficiently. She believed in reducing the role of the state in the economy. In her worldview, the private sector was often better placed to deliver public services, and market forces should be given a free hand, and entrepreneurial energies unshackled. In taking such a laissez-faire approach towards regulating the private sector, it is argued that small government lowers costs and promotes efficiency by allowing the market to determine prices and economic outcomes. 
The underlying philosophy of Thatcherism had a huge impact and influenced governments around the world, including Singapore's. So in the 1990s, the Singapore government began changing its approach, focused on creating leaner public administration while delivering better services. To this end, the government sought to harness the creativity and dynamism of the private sector to deliver public services and to achieve efficiency gains from the forces of competition. It explored ways in which government could divest its interests and allow for entrepreneurial energies to flourish. The privatization of our state-owned utilities began with Singapore Telecoms in 1993, and this was followed by the liberalization of the entire telecoms sector. In the electricity sector, our own privatization and liberalization experience was also very much influenced by the experience of the British government, particularly in its decision to vertically separate the industry. But things do not stand still. This is, after all, the Anthropocene and the era of the Great Acceleration. The 1990s also saw another evolution in the thinking about government. The focus shifted towards integrated or joined up government, one that coordinates efforts across departments, harnesses new information technologies, and partners the private sector to deliver better services. David Osborne and Ted Gabler, in their groundbreaking book, Reinventing Government, wrote, governments that steer more and roll less are clearly stronger governments. After all, those who steer the boat have far more power over its destination than those who row it. So the aim was no longer to shrink governments, but to emulate best practices in the corporate world to stay relevant. These would include adopting new technologies, embracing principles of customer-centric design, and giving greater attention to customer experience. The aim instead was to make governments more effective, more efficient, and more focused on delivering better services to their, to their customers in the private and the people sectors. And in this context, many services that government provides require agencies to work together. And this is often uh, described as networked government, which is the synthesis of four trends. First, joined up government that is aimed at providing integrated service through getting multiple agencies of government to join together. Our economic development board's much admired and copied concept of the one-stop shop is an example of joined up government. Potential investors only have to deal with a single point of contact rather than a plethora of approving agencies. Of course, creating a one-stop shop requires a lot of coordination in the back room among various government agencies and ministries. It requires them to work together in a networked, coordinated fashion. The alternative is a bloated bureaucracy, slow service, and frustrated customers. Second, the digital revolution, in which advances in infocom technologies are harnessed to enable government agencies to share information exchange data and collaboration in real time with other government agencies and with external partners to deliver faster and more accurate services to the public. Third, outsourcing the use of private firms and non-profit organizations as opposed to just using government employees to deliver better services and to achieve policy goals. And lastly, Increasing consumer sophistication, which leads to increased citizen demand for more control of their lives and more choice in their public services to match the customized service provision that already exists in the private sector. The whole of government approach which I introduced in my first lecture is a natural evolution of networked government with a mindset of more integrated collaboration already established among government agencies through networked government, whole of government has emerged in Singapore, at least, as an important response to managing complexity and dealing with wicked problems. And in this approach, instead of breaking down a wicked problem into smaller parts 
and then leave it to each agency to make its own decentralized and bounded decisions. Whole of government promotes not just backroom coordination to provide public services in a more efficient manner. It also emphasizes sharing of information among ministries, statutory boards, and other agencies at the strategic level in order to take in different ideas and insights. And this is so that wicked problems can be viewed in their manifold dimensions and so that the appropriate policy prescriptions and plans can be developed. Today, citizens and businesses alike have far higher expectations of government than before. Access to information has increased dramatically in scope and speed as a result of the internet revolution. Social networking platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter have empowered citizens to express their views. Virtual communities are be beginning to shape the debate and context of public policy issues. So the view that government knows best that perhaps characterized the situation at the beginning is increasingly challenged in today's world in which citizens and businesses can easily gain access to much of the information that governments used to monopolize and control in the past. Today, the quality of government in Singapore is routinely listed at the top of a host of global rankings. That Singapore is already operating at the leading edge in many areas of governance means that it is no longer enough for government policymakers just to copy and adapt from elsewhere. For many of the emergent issues that we have to deal with, Singapore will have to evolve its own strategies and approaches. To achieve real breakthroughs, the government will have to depend more and more on its own innovations. And as a result, the government will have to assume new levels of entrepreneurship with its attendant risks and uncertainties. A government that explores will also, at times, have to sacrifice some degree of efficiency in service of discovery, and it will need to become expert at conducting bounded experiments. Indeed, the emergent, complex issues of the 21st century suggest the need for a new paradigm in governance, one that is whole of government, networked, innovative, exploratory, and resilient in the way it confronts the challenges of our time, challenges rooted in complexity and accelerating change of the Anthropocene. What is the appropriate model of governance for Singapore going forward? The coming years will see a growing need for governance which requires collaboration across the public, private, and people sectors, rather than government acting as the sole or dominant player. Today, the government faces a myriad of complex public policy issues in which the trade-offs are much more difficult to make because each could lead to unintended consequences and risks. Many of these public policy issues exceed the capacity of government working alone. Instead, they require the active contribution of the private and the people sectors. A government-centric approach focused on efficiency and productivity will likely give way to a broader approach that leverages on the collective capacity of non-government actors in order to achieve results of higher public value and at an lo overall lower cost to society. How governments interact with the, public and pri with the private and people sectors will in turn determine how big a role each of these sectors will play. It is often overlooked that the Singapore government has been a world leader in the engagement of the private sector. A succession of five economic reviews, the Economic Committee of 1986, the Committee on Singapore's Competitiveness of 1998, the Economic Review Committee of 2003, the Economic Strategies Committee of 2008, and most recently the Committee of the Future Economy, saw the public and private sectors coming together every few years to produce far-reaching policy recommendations 
for Singapore's long-term economic competitiveness. A major factor that determines the size of our government has been our belief that free market forces should determine prices and economic outcomes. This is the approach that is the foundation of small government. But in Singapore, faith in the market has not been uncritical or absolute. Instead, the government recognises that in certain cases, unfettered market forces can result in excessive volatility, negative externalities, and under-provision of merit goods like education, as well as public goods like defence. The economist Danny Roderick outlined a framework that can usefully be applied to understanding how Singapore has chosen to blend the work of markets and the government. First, the government has sought to enable markets. This includes ensuring that rule of law, property rights, and public infrastructure, functions that most governments perform. In Singapore, enabling markets has also included industrial policy and capability development, subjects of some controversy in policy circles around the world, especially among proponents of small government that believe in the laissez-faire approach. Second, the government has sought to regulate markets, and this includes supervision of the financial sector, competition regulation, and taxation of negative externalities, such as high charges for car ownership and road usage, and sin taxes on alcohol and tobacco products, and maybe in future, taxes on sugary drinks, who knows. <laughs> but a key feature of Singapore's approach has been the shift towards lighter regulation accompanied by risk-based supervision, most recently exemplified by MAS's FinTech Regulatory Sandbox. Third, the government has sought to stabilize markets, and this is the bread and butter of macroeconomic management. Singapore's basic approach in monetary and fiscal policy is not far different from global practices, but its efforts to address asset price inflation and credit crises are interesting examples of targeted interventions that harness market forces. Fourth, the government has sought to legitimize markets. Globalization, free trade, and open markets lead to significant dislocations. Some of the sharpest debates over the role of governments centers on this. To what extent should governments facilitate adjustments, redistribute incomes, or provide social safety nets? so as to maintain public support for market-oriented policies. Complementing government and markets is the role that society will play in tackling the great challenges and wicked problems of the 21st century. A key part of this governance process will be growing mutual engagement between the public and people sectors. In its 2011 National Day rally, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong underscored the importance of such engagement, pointing out that the nation needs, and I quote, to harness diverse views and ideas, put aside personal interests, and forge common goals. Now, this is especially important because people's expectations have changed and are changing continuously. And I think that there are a couple of reasons for this development. The first reason is that as government policies lead to improvements, the needs of the people change in tandem. And this is explained by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's proposition was that after the basic physiological needs of a person are met, more complex psychological needs will have to be fulfilled. And at the top of this hierarchy of needs are the need for self-actualization, which is to realize the individual's potential and transcendence, which is helping others to achieve self-actualization. So if you accept this proposition of Abraham Maslow, then after government has delivered on the basic needs of food, security, shelter, transport, and health, expectations of the people are going to change, not in demanding more of the basic needs, but in fulfilling more of their psychic needs in the upper reaches of Maslow's hierarchy, including social, economic, and self-actualization needs. 
sorry, social, emotional, and self-actualization needs. The challenge for governments everywhere is that success in delivering the material goods in life, housing, food, and so on, is no guarantee that it can be successful in delivering the good life, however defined. And I suppose the reverse is true as well, although it is hard to imagine the good life without the basic necessities of livability. The second reason is what I term the third generation effect. Singapore is now 51 years old and into its third generation of Singaporeans. The first generation of Singaporeans lived through the turbulence and uncertainties of merger and separation. The next generation started life on a firmer footing, but at the same time imbibed from their parents a sense of the vulnerabilities. But the third generation of Singaporeans have known only the affluence and success of Singapore. For them, the uncertainties of the 60s and 70s are abstractions from their school history books. When their grandparents speak of the turmoil and danger that they experience, they shrug their shoulders because it is an experience outside theirs. Of course, they are hardly to blame for this, and they certainly need not apologize for it. Singapore's founding generation made the sacrifices in order that their children and their grandchildren would enjoy peace and prosperity. But clearly, what persuaded their parents and grandparents will not wash with the third generation. But so long as we are all in this together, and I hope that they feel that we are in this together, the hopes and dreams of our youth must also appreciate the tough realities that endure. By all means, dream, but dream with your eyes open. So communicating with the third generation will require fresh arguments and different approaches. Citizens today feel empowered because of the social media and higher levels of educational achievement. Indeed, Singaporeans today are much better educated than their grandparents. In 1965, the cohort participation rate for university education was a minuscule 3%. Today, it is 30%. The non-profit group Ground Up Initiative GUI, points precisely to how attitudes are changing in Singapore. GUI operates a 26,000 square meter kampong campus space in Katib with the aim of reconnecting urbanites, that means all of us, to the natural environment. The group's founder, Mr. Taylai Hawk, said, and I quote, I think the top should set the example, but I also believe you first and foremost must take responsibility for your own life. Don't blame anybody. Don't blame the government. I have a choice to decide that even though they have made this policy, I don't want to be a victim of their policies. In 2011, the Land Transport Authority announced plans to construct a road that would cut through Bukit Brown, the oldest cemetery in Singapore. Heritage groups protested while the government maintained its position on needing land in land scarce Singapore. When Bukit Brown Cemetery was placed on the World Monuments Watch in 2013, one member of the group, All Things Bukit Brown, said, again I quote, I hope it shows that we are serious, that we want a seat at the table, just so we can present what we have heard from the community, what we have heard from the people who have encouraged us, you want development, but let's have a discussion, perhaps. The government has to deal with an electorate that feels empowered, demanding, and actively seeks participation. In this regard, our Singapore conversation launched in 2013 signaled the government's commitment to listening to the people's views. By looking at issues from the perspective of end users, namely the citizen, the government is able to better design policies than if they were just developed using the usual top-down approach. During the 2013 haze, experts had advised the government to consider releasing another indicator besides the Pollutant Standards Index readings, and this was the PM 2.5 readings, which measure particles smaller than 2.5 microns. And this is because PM2.5 particles greatly affect people with heart disease, 
as well as children and the elderly. When the haze began, the government published the three-hour PSI readings and 24-hour PM 2.5, but netizens and doctors pointed out that PSI did not factor in PM 2.4 readings, PM 2.5 readings as air quality indicators. Members of the public also expressed concern that the PSI values appeared different from what they had observed and experienced. Singaporeans even resorted to taking their own real-time air quality readings using commercial equipment. The government at first said that it would be confusing for the public to have too many figures to read, but in the end, because of the persistence of the public, NEA began providing more information on PM 2.5. From 20th June 2013, it began publishing the PSI and PM 2.5 figures hourly, and this was six days after the haze began. And eventually, from 1st April 2014, Singapore moved into an integrated air quality reporting index with PM 2.5 incorporated into the PSI as its sixth pollutant parameter. Now, I've spent some time explaining how and why society in Singapore is evolving and how the government itself has to evolve in tandem. Put simply, it means a shift from the paternalistic and interventionist government to you and government for you to government with you. The imperative is for government to move towards a collaborative approach to policy making and be prepared to connect, consult and co-create with the people and the private sectors. Now, the bureaucratic propensity is to create order and consistency both in the external environment and domestically. In Singapore, the inclination is to manage, to manage even extends to our wildlife. The recent case of chicken culling in Sinming is one example. Ms. Natalia Huang, an ecologist at an environmental consultancy, Ecology Matters, recently suggested in the Straits Times that Singapore is land scarce, even regulating the number of cars in the road Wildlife should likewise be regulated. With scientific research on how much space to allow wildlife intensity growth, we could ensure that wildlife in Singapore is sustainable. Now, while governments and people try to reduce the complexity out there by coming up with all kinds of regulatory systems, there is really a limit to how much order we can or should produce in our complex environment. It is both an aesthetic as well as an economic issue. Literacy, political structures, level of industrialization, and per capita income are conventional e indicators of economic health. However, economists like Ricardo Hausmann, Cesar Hidalgo, Luciano Petronero have suggested that the most important predictor of growth is economic complexity or the diversity of products that an economy possesses. Countries with the most natural resources tend to have simple economies as they do not produce unique goods. Thus, economies that are dependent on a particular kind of export, for example, oil or timber, may do well when demand for these products are high, but fail in the long run because they are not diversified enough and cannot compete in other sectors. The ability to produce unique goods and services depends on the amount of productive knowledge in an economy. This is the kind of knowledge derived from experience and exposure to different sectors and domains of production. Invention and innovation occurs when these bits of productive knowledge are connected. Improvements to economic growth can be achieved either by harnessing existing capabilities in new combinations or by accruing new capabilities to expand the productive potential of the country. It is an important outcome of economic complexity. So governance of a city-state like Singapore is not all about reducing complexity. Far from it. Instead, in some cases, it should catalyze complexity by creating more networks to connect multiple economic domains. The Harvard economist, Professor Edward Glaser, tells of how Boston, 
in the 17th and 18th century was the leading port in America. It thrived as a conduit of goods between the old world and the new. But by the mid-18th century, Boston as a port had been eclipsed, first by Philadelphia and then by New York. But what saved Boston from the fate of other New England ports was a large population of Irish immigrants. By the late 19th century, Boston had transformed itself into a center of manufacturing built on migrant labor, and it prospered on the back of America's industrialization. But this heady period of growth was over by 1920. Population growth slowed and even began to shrink in Boston after 1950. However, in the last two decades of the 20th century, Boston once again reinvented itself, this time from an industrial city in decline into a high-tech service-based economy. Its population grew rapidly between 1980 and 2000, reversing 50 years of stagnation and shrinkage. Boston is now a center of the information economy. Today, education is the dominant factor in the economy. It ranks highly in its share of employees in managerial and professional jobs. Its top four export industries today are all skills-based, technology, finance, education, and healthcare. Now, using the lens of economic complexity, the Boston case shows us that the ability to reorientate and create new value hinges on economic complexity. From its earliest days, Boston was never just a port. Artisans manufactured some of the goods traded in Bostonian ships. Boston had banks, brokers, and insurers from its seafaring days because shipping needed financial services. Education was always valued in the colony. Harvard University was founded in 1636 with government money. So its rich, complex strengths and competencies enabled Boston to reach within itself to find new connections and value propositions. And these enabled Boston to reinvent itself time and again when other, more brittle, less economically complex cities like Detroit, which was heavily dependent on manufacturing, especially automobiles, went into terminal decline. Can Singapore rely on our position as a global transshipment hub, or will we have to confront the possibility in the future that changes in technology, logistics patterns, and geopolitical shifts that our preeminence as a global port will decline? And then, like Boston, will we be able to reinvent ourselves? When a government becomes bogged down by the minutiae of day-to-day -day operations, the risk is that it will not be making the big decisions needed to take a country forward in a timely fashion. Arguably, the modern metropolis that is Singapore was itself an act of faith in the people, an act of imagination and courage born out of challenging circumstances. Jurong Industrial Estate was the key to Dr. Goh Keng Sri's plan to industrialize Singapore and to drive economic growth, shifting the economy away from entrepot trade towards manufacturing. In 1959, the new elected People's, People's Action Party confronted a huge challenge. Sky-high unemployment estimated at 14% or over 200,000 jobless people, and with a population growing at around 4% to boot. Dr. Goh's vision to transform the swamps and jungles and fishing villages of Jurong into a modern industrial estate was based on Dr. Albert Winsemia's report on Singapore's economic potential, which emphasized giving a big boost to manufacturing. Dr. Winsemius was, of course, Singapore's longtime Dutch economic advisor. But there were many skeptics. Jurong was seen by many to be a risky venture given the absence in Singapore of any real track record in manufacturing. The choice of an area for of rural swampland for the project and the huge cost involved. Dr. Goh himself joked that if Jurong failed, it would go down in history as Goh's folly. Still, the government pressed on with Dr. Goh describing the project as an act of faith in the people of Singapore. By 1968, almost 300 factories had been built in Jurong, 
providing employment for 2,000 people. And Jurong's big breakthrough came in 1968, when EDB persuaded Texas Instruments to visit Singapore, which then started up its plant in Jurong within 50 days of its decision to invest. It was an extraordinary vote of confidence in Jurong and in Singapore. Dynamic governance in Singapore is an unending series of reimaginings and reinventions. So Jurong Lake District will be transformed into Singapore's cent second central business district. The KL Singapore high-speed rail terminus will be located there. And Jurong will be the site of the future integrated transport hub, a new gateway to Singapore. The Tanjong Paga container terminal was also another early act of faith. In the 70s, the shipping industry was enduring one of the most severe shipping crises ever experienced, affecting shipping companies with high investments in tankers and tramp or bulk ships. And against this backdrop, the Tanjung Paga container terminal emerged as a potential solution. The country's shipping industry needed to exploit a growing market, and a new transportation mode could possibly help Singapore to remain competitive. And it was a calculated gamble that PSA took under Mr. Howin In Chong's chairmanship. Singapore started building the region's first container port even before a single shipping line had committed to call at Tanjung Paga. The terminal itself was constructed against the advice of professionals. And though business was slow in the 70s, container trade rose in the 80s, giving Singapore first mover advantage, leading it to become the world's busiest container port in 1990. And today, Singapore is the second busiest container port in the world, and only one of two in the 30 million TEU class after Shanghai. The point of this dialectic on governance is not to posit false binaries when there are none. As I said, there are no absolute rights, especially not when the world is constantly changing. What the government needs to do is to prepare itself and Singapore for the black swans and disruptions that will surely surprise us in the future. And to achieve this, the government must put into proper perspective the pressing day-to-day -day concerns within the larger context of longer challenges and uncertainties. The question you may wish to pose is, what is the long view? How far ahead can and should we really think some policy issues, such as demographics, the environment, and education, stretch out over many years. In contrast, a lot of government institutions are designed for four to five year electoral cycles. Even if we had the political will, do we really have the imagination to view and tackle challenges that lie beyond the lifetime of the already born citizen? At the same time, we talk about making the future, but if we were to reframe it, is it also not the case that our actions in the present are taking the future away from unborn generations to come? Here I'm thinking of our actions, or rather inaction, on a global basis re with regard to climate change, as an example. This is a question of responsibilities and trade-offs. On the one hand, the current generation has a responsibility of stewardship, for example, in steering Singapore to SG 100 and beyond. However, in order to fulfill that duty of stewardship of the future, certain tough decisions have to be made in the here and now. How much appetite is there really for long-term thinking in a society that is focused on short-term, dealing with the problems of the day and putting out fires all the time? And this is why thinking about the future is an essential yet delicate task for governments to foster, both as a matter of institutional process and as a habit of thinking. Singapore's success in managing its paradox has been achieved by a mixture of good government, good luck, and a heavy dose of kiasuism. But Andy Grove, the late CEO of Intel, once said, success breeds complacency. Complacency breeds failure. Only the paranoid survive. And this echoes something that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew himself once said, what I fear is complacency. When things always become better, people want, tend to want to work more for less. But of course, 
Too much paranoia can ultimately consume a society. Paranoia suggests always looking over your shoulders, always being driven by threats, rather than also looking out for opportunities. Paranoia taken too far can also lead to a loss of solidarity within society, leading to people viewing the world purely in zero-sum terms. What about being pulled forward by the better angels of our nature instead of being changed by demons? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ho. Uh, just to give him some time to catch his breath, I thought I would begin by sharing a story about uh, Mr. Ho, at least my own personal story. So this was about maybe 10 years back or something, and he gave me a lot of grief then. He was then uh, the head of civil service. I was a young officer in the Ministry of Home Affairs, and my specific job was to plan for a flu pandemic. Uh, and, and you know the implications of a flu pan pandemic, right? Uh, Maybe tens of people would die. People catch the flu, tens of people would die, maybe. But, uh, and we thought all was well and good because my, my efforts were basically to work with the different agencies, work with uh, Ministry of National Development, Ministry of Social uh, and Family and all that. And then Mr. Ho uh, decided to throw a spanner in the works. And he said, no, this is all rubbish, right? You guys are not planning for the worst. So he referred to the Spanish flu where 100 million people died. And literally in Singapore, I think by some records, 3,000 people died. And so he poo-pooed all our work, and he set up his own team of senior high-level officials, and he called that Blue Finch, and he said, you guys challenge the current team in thinking about the scenario. So my job doubled overnight, because in the daytime, I wrote papers about planning for a flu pandemic, and in the nighttime, I wrote papers debunking what his team uh, was criticizing us on. And, but I, I share that story with you, uh, but I think I share that story with you uh, to, to show you what, what kind of person he is, right? He is a person, <laughs> he is a person that, that you know, makes you uncomfortable, but he's a person that's not afraid to ask, quest ask difficult questions, even though you've done a lot of work. And he practices what he preached, right? This was at least 10 years ago, and he's saying the same thing right now, right? Uh, but we all know prophets have no honor in our, their hometown. And now that he's out of the public service, I think, uh, I hope he's able to be more candid about what are some of the, uh, the issues we have to think about. So maybe just to kick us off, uh, you know, I was, actually I was very surprised by how Mr. Ho ended uh, the speech. Because, you know, as a second, gen as, as you know, one generation of civil servant below him, below him right, uh, as a young civil servant, uh, I would have expected an older civil servant to end on the note of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, which is that you guys are too complacent, be careful. Compla success breeds complacency, you know, don't be complacent. But he ended completely differently. He said, perhaps the danger uh, is that we could be too paranoid. And that's uh, very surprising for me because I was ex expecting you know, an old guy saying, you guys haven't eaten enough salt. So what I wanted to ask him was, in what areas in uh, government today that you think, or in Singapore today, that you think uh, we are over paranoid? And in what areas do you think perhaps we are not, compl no, we are too complacent? So maybe let's start there. Well, uh, luckily when you reach my age, uh, and uh, it's not as if I'm that old, but when you reach, <laughs> when you reach, my, when you reach my age, uh, your, your, you, your, ability to recall all these events which uh, my younger friend has uh, tried to recollect are uh, lost to me, so I cannot, remember, <laughs> I, I cannot remember anything of what he said. So if he attributed this to me, uh, well and good, but I, I'm in a happy position of being able to deny that uh, I, I remember that. No, look, this whole business of uh, complacency, paranoia, it's, it's part of a spectrum. And I don't think uh, we can run away from the fact, and this is why the uh, focus of this lecture was about the very precarious position Singapore uh, is in. We are unusual, and I, I hope the lecture brought out some of the unusual characteristics of Singapore. Apart from the obvious things that we are a small country, we are also 
a sovereign state and how do you survive as a so sovereign state? You know, you can compare yourself to other city-states uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Vatican City or Monaco or you compare yourself to city economies like Hong Kong. They don't have to worry about the things we worry about. In fact, I think we are probably the only country that has to worry about the things we worry about. And that is to maintain our position as a sovereign city state for as long as we, for as long as we can. So I think uh, that means you have to be warriors. I think we have to be worried all the time. But if you worry without hope, I think we are also in big trouble. Because if uh, the only function of government is to worry, and if they con uh, convey the sense of worry to the population without at the same time exciting the population about uh, uh, what the mm -hmm. positive things that could happen in the future, then we are going to have uh, a lot of uh, trouble. In fact, this is not an advertisement for my next lecture, but my next lecture is going to be entitled The Future Governance, Unintended Consequences, and the redemption of hope. I'm going to talk about hope because I think it's very uh, critical. So it's not to say that we abandon all this uh, mm -hmm. focus on worrying about things that could go wrong. But at the same time, uh, it's the uh, part of uh, the way we have survived. We have survived because there's been hope. And I would say the first generation leadership gave a lot of hope to the Singaporeans. We started with nothing, but they, somehow we were lucky that we had leaders who gave this hope. Now, the new generation of leaders must still give this hope. It's not as if we are off the treadmill. And, so, and if I can just push you on that, right? are there areas in which you think we are in danger of being over paranoid that we have lost hope? Uh, no, in fact, uh, my worry is the opposite. My worry is uh, the, that we uh, think that we have arrived and we have started to succeed in a whole range of things. And in fact, we have been very successful. I won't uh, itemize them, but I think the big danger for us is not uh, that we are uh, too paranoid, but we are not paranoid enough. And, uh, you know, what are the things that could upset uh, the apple cart for Singapore? There are many things. Uh, I mentioned the port as one example. I'm not picking on the port, but I'm familiar with the port because I was the chairman of the Maritime and Port Authority many years ago. And right from day one, I asked the question, what happens when the transshipment model no longer works? Are we prepared for that day? Just because you're successful, you're the uh, world's busiest port, you're the uh, number two container port in the world, you have become a... Uh, uh, international Maritime Center doesn't mean that your position cannot be dislodged uh, because of changing technologies. What happens if something replaces uh, container traffic? In fact, I remember uh, just recently reading a very interesting study. This is about 3D printing or additive uh, manufacturing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the study, I think, done by PwC, Pricewaterhouse, uh, shows that something like 37% of global container traffic will be affected once 3D printing goes mainstream. And of course, this, this same principle applies even to, uh, uh, to, to your air cargo. Same problem. So disruptions are going to be uh, everywhere, and if you're not thinking about these things, and you have invested in infrastructure that, uh, you have to invest in this infrastructure, but you're not thinking about what could happen uh, if things change, and they will change, then you are going to be caught uh, uh, and you have a lot of problems. Thank you for that. Maybe just one more question before I open to the floor, uh, which is that you talked about how we need to shift from government to governance and from government uh, of you, uh, for you, to government with you. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about what are some of the structures that we need? What are some of the new models of organization that government needs to consider? Uh, I think you alluded to some of that in your previous lectures. Well, well I, I think uh, I've already touched on uh, something which I think we tend to do uh, relatively well, and that is uh, in the economic arena where the government has 
quite regularly and quite systematically found a way to engage the private sector. And this is not just tokenism, you know, where the government says, oh, I want to talk to you and we talk to the private sector. They, uh, all these uh, economic committees which I touched on are very serious uh, efforts to get uh, inputs uh, from uh, the private sector and to take these inputs to uh, review whether the assumptions of economic policy uh, need to be uh, changed. And if they do, I think the government has shown that it's prepared to change. So in a sense, there are no sacred cows. Now, uh, I think uh, it's also very clear that the area which uh, the government is uh, beginning to take more seriously is engaging the people sector. This is a newer area. It is perhaps uh, a slightly more uncomfortable for the government, but I think the first major step was the Our Singapore conversation. But of course, you're not going to have Our Singapore conversation every year or every, every few years. It's a huge undertaking. But I think that is a sign that government acknowledges they have to engage the uh, 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 people sector. And in smaller ways, I think a lot of uh, policies which we do, do require uh, this early engagement. I think it is not as if uh, the man in the street doesn't understand that uh, decisions have to be made and sometimes decisions uh, uh, will not uh, meet with uh, 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 cheers all round. But I think what they want to do is they want to be involved in the process and that means the government must uh, uh, engage early, not late in the day. I think part of the problem with uh, Bukit Brown, if I may say, is that the engagement came, it was an engagement, but it came rather late in the day when the plans were already uh, kind of looked as if they were uh, uh, more or less firmed up. And I think you can uh, uh, try to think of a future where you start talking about these uh, plans much earlier on, before they are kind of signed, sealed and delivered. Great. So uh, let's open the floor for questions. Uh, before you ask your question, can I ask you to just uh, state your name, uh, where you're from, and then uh, ask your question briefly. We have a hard stop at 7.30, so that's 20 minutes. So let's, let's go. Um, I'm uh, Leong Wai Ling. I'm from Temasek. Uh, but this is a, a question of personal interest, nothing to do with the organisation I come from. Peter, you started the, conversa uh, started the lecture by talking that Sovereign city-states are exceptions, and if you look at history. So what is your prediction of Singapore's uh, continuity and survival as a sovereign city-state, uh, say 30 years, 50 years from now? And you believe that Singapore will pros continue to prosper as one? What makes Singapore so special? Well, uh I, I'm, not in the, I'm not really in the business of uh, trying to make predictions. I've stated uh, in all my, uh, including this lecture, that uh, prediction is one of the most hazardous uh, 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 things one could uh, try to do. And uh, I, I think, and I want to fall back on uh, they're not uh, apple for apple comparisons, but the two examples I brought up of uh, both Boston and uh, 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 Venice. Uh, Venice lasted for, I think, almost 700 uh, years before it finally got absorbed. I think the Austrians took over uh, Venice and finally got absorbed into the Italian uh, uh, state. But it was able uh, despite a lot of uh, challenges along the way, despite the uh, loss of uh, its uh, special routes to, uh, to the east, uh, to places like uh, London and Amsterdam, it, it still managed to make its way in the world and stay as a viable city-state for 700 years. Uh, Boston uh, 
is an example of a city. It's not a city state, but it's a city. And of course, you know, in, in uh, larger countries, uh, cities uh, come and go. But Boston is an example of a city that has uh, prospered in spite of uh, challenges. Now, what, uh, what is common? One of the things is, that is common, apart from all these being small and reasonably self-contained, is the fact of, uh, I think, uh, uh, good governance. Good governance is very critical. In fact, the Venice example is a, a case of uh, good governance. They're very imaginative in many of the practices adopted in uh, Venice, including willingness to bring in foreign talent. Uh, uh, characterized, uh, characterized Venice. Venice looked after uh, its own defense, but it also knew how to uh, uh, run a very nimble uh, foreign policy, which uh, meant it could somehow find, uh, navigate through the challenges of its being surrounded by a lot of uh, big and rapacious uh, neighbors. So that was uh, Venice. The example of uh, Boston, which I wanted to bring in, is uh, you also have to make some decisions about what kind of uh, economy you, you are. Because uh, if you tend to have, uh, as I indicated, uh, an economy based on single product, you're going to have a lot of trouble. So if you want to keep going, you have to be able to reinvent yourself all the time. In, in a way, uh, Venice was a bit brittle, but it's still a miracle that they lasted for so long. It's brittle because they were highly dependent on uh, being at the top of one of the big trade routes. And when, that, uh, got, uh, when they ceded that to the uh, Brits and to the Dutch, uh, I think that had a big impact on them, but they still stayed on f uh, for long enough. So I think the short answer is, I think nobody knows what's going to happen to Singapore, but the whole purpose of uh, making the presentation today is you, you can uh, uh, look forward with some confidence if you recognize uh, the world for what it is and if you're prepared to make some of the hard decisions uh, to keep uh, going. And if you do that, then we, we just... Uh, keep on uh, going like this uh, ever ready bunny, you know, you just uh, uh, keep on going. But I don't know. But I would say, uh, which is why, you, you, which is why uh, I go back to my first response to Kai Fong's point. You know, we have to be paranoid. But without hope, it's no use. They have to go in tandem. So you have to be paranoid because paranoid helps you make hard decisions, and you have to make tough decisions. But tough decisions without hope, and hope is critical to bringing the whole system along with you. You cannot make it. So I think this boils down to, in the end, good government and good governance, good leadership. Okay, next question. Gentleman there. I mean, it, 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 in, in one word, it's probably uh, the government has to focus a lot on how it communicates. And when you have very complex uh, policies, whether it's CPF or whatever, and they are getting very uh, complex because there are a lot of rules which are attached to it, uh, the communication itself is a non-trivial uh, matter. And I think any government agency which is uh, responsible for rolling out these uh, complicated uh, policies needs to spend a lot of time thinking about how it's going to communicate. If they don't think about it and they only think about it as an afterthought, 
it lead to a lot of confusion and I think some pushback, uh, which is also related to the point I made in response to an earlier uh, question, which is it's also important that when you are uh, tackling some of these wicked problems and you need uh, to have some buy-in and uh, communication is also about buy-in, uh, you need to have early engagement to explain why this is an issue, what the problems are, why there's no uh, straightforward solution and why there has to be some kind of compromise and why sometimes the decision may have to go against what uh, some would, would like. But it's this whole process of co communication which is vital. I'm not simply talking about communicating through tweets and things like that. I'm talking about serious uh, communication. Sometimes you have to go through, you have to go through town halls you know, and spend, spend that time because I think tweets are not good enough when you're dealing with uh, complex uh, issues. Thank you very much, sir. Yep. Uh, Rahul? Hi, my name is Rahul from Schools Future Singapore. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lowe. My question is, earlier you, you talked about how Singapore has been successful because we adapt, not because we adopt. But now that's no longer going to be sufficient. We need to innovate and create our own policies. Uh, for that to happen, what kind of culture does our society need to have and how will we develop towards having that kind of culture? Uh, well, I, I think uh, you have uh, identified something that I, I feel quite strongly about. Uh, as you say, it's no longer just about uh, adoption, it's uh, about adaptation, but more importantly, it's about innovation because we are dealing with uh, new types of problems. And uh, if other governments haven't grappled with this problem, if you want to be ahead of the game, we, o we have to uh, then deal with these problems and uh, find our own uh, way forward. But, and this is uh, really the nub of the issue, uh, for that, uh, it's not, uh, I think it starts in government. How brave are the uh, civil servants who are going to have to formulate these innovative responses uh, how brave are they to try out something that is new, that has no uh, real precedent? You know, think about it, it's possible to do that. We've done this before. Uh, a case that springs to mind is the old area licensing scheme which morphed into the, the ERP. We were one of the uh, first to uh, do something on such a systematic uh, uh, scale as uh, we, we did in the past. But that requires a certain uh, courage and a willingness to uh, try, something, uh, try something out. So it's not as if we don't have that kind of experience. The question is, uh, is that instinct still deeply embedded uh, in our system? Uh, and and I, I, I think, uh, I personally uh, feel that sometimes we tend to underrate ourselves because the reality is as a government, we are actually performing at the leading edge. We are doing actually very well. And there are many things which uh, we do well, which are a result of uh, an innovative spirit. I, a lot of the people I used to interact with when I was still in service used to admire Singapore. And I think they still do. So we should not uh, put ourselves down and think we are not able to uh, innovate. I think we can and we should. OK, next question. OK. You'll be next, yeah. You'll After, be next, After, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I run the Singapore Bullying Market Association. Um, we have, I mean, Singapore is a small nation, and uh, we have been proud of self governing our country well. And all senior government servants and the leader are meticulous in running the country and in very detail and trying to engage the people. But Nowadays, there's an emergence of this big nation, uh, Mr. Trump, and also from um, Philippines, uh, Mr. Duty. I mean, their way of communication and the way of that we perceive.
see is very carefully, very simple. Even the, the wording they use is, is very unsophisticated. How would you see this emerging trend that these leaders of major nations, how the way they govern? Is it a reaction to the changes in the people sectors, or this is simply that somebody picked a way of trying to be different from the previous administration, which may be less successful as as the people perceive? I'd like to have your comment. On this. Thank you. Uh, what? I I think uh, uh, some of the developments we have seen, particularly in the last uh, year, uh, are the result of, uh, uh, in a way, uh, disappointment in the ability of governments uh, to deliver the goods. So a lot of people are uh, very uh, frustrated. They are even angry. And so uh, they have lost their faith in the traditional form of uh, governments. And so they are prepared to uh, put a bet that maybe uh, other types of uh, governments may do better. Uh, so this is what uh, we see in the form of uh, uh, more populist governments being uh, elected a rising uh, form of uh, nationalism. Uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, I think, partly a failure of uh, government. Governments have failed. They have failed to uh, confront the issues. They have failed to communicate the issues. And they have failed to deliver <coughs> on the solutions. So when people lose their faith in these kinds of governments, then they will, uh, I think, put their bets in snake oil uh, solutions. And I think they will, in the end, be, uh, my personal view is that they will be uh, disappointed. But do we really have to go through that sort of pain? So I think this is the unfortunate situation we are in. Now, in Singapore, uh, I think uh, you, you, have to, you have to make a choice. What type of government do we want? Do you want a populist government? Do you want a government that uh, tweets all the time and changes its, uh, changes its uh, view uh, on the turn of a dime, as they say? Or do you want uh, issues to be discussed soberly, maturely, and uh, working out, I think, the best possible uh, solutions under the circumstances and with the resources that we have? I think we all have to make these kind of choices. The people have spoken in other countries. They have made choices. I personally think that the choices they made were not very good choices, but they've made those choices, and they have to live with those choices. Likewise, in Singapore, we have to decide what kind of government we, we want. And as I said, the government itself has to evolve with the times. It is not that they need to indulge in uh, populism or uh, become more nationalist. But I think they have to recognize that people's uh, expectations are changing. You have to manage these expectations. If we can't manage these expectations, it's no point talking about uh, you know, coming up with the uh, best possible policy solution if you're not going to get buy-in or you're not going to get support. Uh, it's almost time. Uh, almost time. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't think of pain. I'm uh, retired. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Coming here, you know, related to the earlier question about something you feel strongly about, about the innovation. And then going back right from the beginning, the opening of paranoia and so on. In a strange way, I think, you know, I would use the word risk taking for innovation. In a strange way, when the first generation of leaders took over, they were highly risk-taking. Uh, you can call it innovative about Jurong and Go Soli. Right now, we have built up so much. You know, in normal economic terms, when you are very well off and you've got a lot of resources, financial intervention, you can afford to take more risk. But it seems to me we have got to the situation now. It's almost like you've got so much to lose, you know, so we're not going to take any risk. Whereas at the earlier generation, we got very little 
to lose, that's so we, we can afford to take the risk. And it's quite telling, Peter, that you, you mentioned about the silver servants, you know, who are no longer as risk taking. But the risk taking of the nature we are talking about, and if you go back to the first generation, it's done by the politicians, the people running the show, right? If the first generation of leaders had left it to the civil servants then, I'm not sure all the things that happened would have happened. You know, so that begs the question, you know, of the kind that when you talk about the civil servant, is it really the civil servants or is it higher than that? I, I think it is. I, I mean, for, for the kind of thing you're talking about, the, the innovation, which are the big innovations, not the small uh, innovations. In fact, I don't like that. In some ways, I don't like the term innovation because it means you're innovating here, there, everywhere. But actually, you're talking about the big transformations, the game changes. Who's going to, who's going to make them? I think uh, that is not just a question of uh, the top leadership being prepared to do that. It's also a question of whether the, uh, the government up and down the line are prepared to make uh, those uh, changes. And of course, you, you lose uh, nothing uh, by preserving the status quo, if you will, in the short term. Of course, in the long term, it's going to lead to uh, dysfunction and uh, misalignment. And if you, I, I don't mean, because these are all lectures in a part of a series, if you attended my uh, last uh, lecture, uh, I spoke about Clayton Christensen, who spoke about the innovator's dilemma. And he identified the basic problem. And this is a conundrum of every successful organization, whether you're a company or whether you're a government or your country. Once you become successful, uh, you are caught on the horns of a dilemma. On the one hand, trying to preserve the uh, your achievements, your success, while having knowing that uh, you know there are all kinds of insurgents who are snapping at your, who are snapping at your hooves and who are trying to dislodge you from your uh, 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 pole position. This is a dilemma, and all successful organisations and countries, I'm afraid, are in a sense trapped on the horns of this dilemma. But that makes it very important that you have a certain humility that just because you have uh, succeeded, you're not uh, necessarily going to feel confident that that success is going to continue. Now, I spoke about this in my last lecture, and I mentioned uh, the importance of uh, taking a leaf out of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Clayton Christensen's uh, book, The Innovator's Dilemma, which is to create uh, small disruptive uh, organizations within the, within the larger organization whose job it is to try new things out. These are what they call bounded experiments. They try things out, they succeed, they succeed, then you proliferate, you uh, extend. If they fail, it's self-contained and it doesn't. But if you don't have that habit of trying new things out, then I'm afraid in the long run, you lose that uh, sharpness, which is vital to staying ahead of the game. And so I, I would say this is not just uh, something for the top political leadership, it's also something for uh, the government as a whole. And I gave the example in my uh, talk the last time. What, what did we do in MINDEF? We created the Future Systems Directorate, whose job was to innovate. And on the backs of the innovations they did, we created the third generation Singapore Armed Forces. So you have to think of things like that. I'm not saying it will work everywhere, but we have to think of things like that. If you don't, you're in big trouble. Okay, maybe we'll have one, one last question. Uh, from the uh, gentleman. Uh, can you hear? Yes. Uh, my name is Francis Pavri, uh, currently unemployed. <laughs> uh, this question relates in some ways to the first question about hope. Uh, you meant for the last 50 years, we've done a remarkable job, in, uh, nothing short of a miracle. You know, we, we've uh, reclaimed land, uh, even our water, which was very uh, dicey initially, now we're quite comfortable. In fact, so comfortable that uh, in 2011, when one of the agreements with Malaysia was uh, uh, stopped, we didn't even feel it, we didn't even know about it. 
So that's been for the last 50 years. My question actually pertains to the future. And since you are future studies, maybe you can answer this, but maybe you can keep it for your next lecture to talk about it, because I understand part of the next lecture is about hope. But in very, in very many ways, I feel hopeless, largely because the problems that have been solved have been solved, but the problems in the future seems to hit what I consider the physical limitation. It's not mental, it's not, it's physical. Talking one, uh, three things, one, space. We've done a remarkable job with space. We were 600 square kilometers, now we're 700 square kilometers. We've done, but how far more can you go? Currently, we have five and a half million people. By 2030, we have 6.9 million. And then what? 10 million? I mean, if five and a half million people, the roads are jammed, the, the MRTs are always crowded, etc. How far more can we go to solve these problems? That's one. <laughs> Second is water. I mean, we, we talked about water, right? Can we get enough water anymore? I mean, there's, there is a limit again. And the third, of course, the third problem is demography. As you all know, Singapore's largest problem now, it, the people are getting older, uh, insufficient young people to support the old. So these are all physical constraints, and I can't see us solving it in the next 50 years. Of course, I don't have to worry, I don't have that long to live, which is fantastic, I think. <laughs> but many other people will have to. So how do you think, apart from you know, Venice disappearing, Singapore might disappear as a sovereign state? Thank you. We have well, some students okay. here, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, First, I think we shouldn't be uh, too despondent because uh, I think uh, the human uh, race has shown a remarkable ability to uh, innovate and to come up with new solutions. But let me uh, just address your, 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 a few of your points. First, if you say you won't be around, I'm not so sure because if we believe uh, the, the data, actually, a lot of people who are alive here in this room today, uh, they'll live to 100 and beyond. Certainly the students, I think, are going to uh, hit 100 and beyond. So you may still be around to uh, see the effects of uh, your sins of omission or sins of commission. <laughs> but having, having, having said that, uh, I think uh, let's just touch on a couple of things, huh? because some of them I will touch in my next lecture. Let's touch on this issue of space. Uh, space, what do you mean by space? Today, uh, we got 12% of the land area in Singapore is devoted to roads. How much of our land space is devoted to housing? 14%. They're almost on par. Now, so when the government talks about a car light Singapore, this vision of a car light Singapore, is as much to uh, uh, make sure that we have a sustainable uh, uh, transportation system as we can, but it's also about uh, trying to uh, reduce uh, the amount of uh, roads we have in Singapore. We just, uh, you know, so that's one way. But there are other big solutions. Big solutions include underground uh, space. So why must space always be uh, what we see above ground? Uh, of course, you can think of space by uh, going upwards. What about our sea space? Why should the sea space be used in the way it's been uh, done before? I've been reading a book called Seasteading about people uh, who've got this vision of building cities at sea. And it's possible. The technology is uh, 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 available. So a lot of the things which we look as absolute limitations today are actually... Uh, uh, being transformed uh, because uh, there are new because there are new uh, technologies. Uh, likewise, you talked about uh, water, space. Uh, wa water. Okay, uh, demography. I think water will continue to have to find uh, new ways. And actually, Singapore is in a. Although we worry a lot about water, one of our most fortunate things is we are surrounded by sea. So for so long as the sea is there, uh, we, 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 we've, got, we've got options. In fact, our problem is maybe we've got too much sea because if there's rising sea level, then we've got more sea than we really need. But 
you know, that's a problem which we'll continue to tackle. So never think of uh, uh, the future in discrete terms. You must think of the future as a continuum. There will be continuous challenges, but hopefully if you've got the right mindset, you're thinking about the problems, you can find uh, innovative solutions. So this is why hope is very critical. So perhaps to, to sum up, let me just sum up with a quote since uh, Mr. Ho likes to use quotes, right? And it's by Scott Fitzgerald who wrote Great, Great Gatsby. And he said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retaining the ability to function. And I think tonight we have heard many opposing ideas, many paradoxes, uh, most encapsulated in Singapore. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a test of a first-rate intelligence. But actually, many people don't know the sentence that comes after that, and I want to leave that with you. And the sentence that comes after that quote is, one should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. And I think that's the spirit in which we'll end. Thank you, Mr. Ho and Kai Fung. Mr. Ho's fourth and last lecture will be on 17 May. Details on our website. We very much hope to see you then. Good evening and thank you.